webinar today um, on the role of the CCC Online subject matter expert. So joining me to present this today are Pamela Dunnington, who is one of our instructional designers here at CCC Online, and John Reagan, who is both our Teaching Excellence Auditor as well as one of our program chairs here at CCC Online. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sean Renner, and I am our professional development specialist here at CCC Online. So um, just to start it off here, uh, we've got a little overview for you of what we're going to be covering. And John's going to kind of give us a little rundown. Hello, everyone. Hopefully the uh, sound is coming through OK. Um, SMEs are instructors who are given a contract to either revise a course or to create a brand new course. And this presentation today on the role of the SME is valuable for a variety of individuals. Number one, if you're an instructor who has never done a course project before but might do one in the future, then this presentation will be uh, very helpful for you. Or if you have done a course project in the past as an SME, uh, but it's been a while, uh, this presentation will get you up to date on how the process works today. Or even if you never do a course project and never uh, work as an SME on such a project, you will sometimes find that a course you've been teaching has been revised. And today's webinar will show you what has taken place behind the scenes when such a revision occurs. We'll talk today about the course design process, the various course design roles when a course project is undertaken. Again, whether that's for the purpose of revising an existing course or creating a brand new one. We'll talk about the importance of learning objectives when you work on a course project. Also talk about the master course template which is now used at CCC Online. Whenever a course gets revised or a new course gets created, it gets put into the master course template format. And we'll also mention uh, Quality Matters, uh, which is a method by which the quality of a course's design can be determined. And here uh, you just see a layout of each of the important items we'll be uh, talking about today. Sorry, I kind of jumped the gun on moving that slide forward a little That's bit okay. there. <laughs> so um, the first thing we want to do here is just give you an overview of the course design process. So as John mentioned, uh, this webinar is really going to be beneficial for pretty much anybody who works CCC online um, because this course design process is an essential part of what we do. And, uh, you know, whether you're an SME or just an instructor, it's really great to understand what goes into the courses and how they're actually constructed. So understanding the role of an SME definitely entails understanding the course design process itself. So this um, graphic here gives you a great overview of the five steps in our course design process, and there's really six. There's kind of an invisible one at the end, uh, which we'll touch on. But the first step in the course design process is creating the vision. And you'll see in each of these that the roles that we are talking about are going to be bolded. So in this step one here where the vision is created, the associate dean is really taking the lead there, putting the vision together for the course. They're going to get support from the program chairs, the SMEs, the instructional designers, librarian, and other folks to help them do that. But they're really taking those core competencies that are created by the system uh, for each course and creating a vision for what, um, what the learning objectives and the assignments for that course should look like. So the second step there is actually the creation of the content. So once that vision is created that says, here's the kind of assignments we want, here's how they're going to align with the competencies that the state has created for this course, then in that second step, the SME 
is going to be creating the content, creating the assignment instructions and details, creating um, the discussions, creating actual lecture content for the course. And they're going to collaborate with the instructional designer on that as well. And then in that third step, the content is finalized. So here the instructional designer and the associate deans, they're just going to look at that content that was created by the SME, review it, and finalize it. And then in the fourth step, the actual course shell is created. So it's it's important to note here that you'll see in these first three steps, nothing has taken place yet in Desire to Learn, our actual online management system. The first three steps, the creation of the content and the vision, none of that is actually building the course itself. So in the fourth step, this is where the instructional designer's expertise really comes into play, actually taking that content and putting it into a design that makes sense in the online learning environment. And then in the fifth step here, um, the course shell is finalized. So after the course is created, the instructional designer and the associate dean are going to review that course just so we have more than one pair of eyes going over it, going through a checklist to make sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. And then that sixth invisible step that we'll kind of talk about later is a review process, which is somewhat informal, but of course the last step in any course design process is reviewing to make sure that it works and then coming back to step one again if it needs to be redesigned. So here's just a quick list of those roles that we saw outlined in that course design process graphic. Our program chair, our associate deans, our instructional designers, subject matter experts, and online librarians. So with that, we're going to kind of get into each of these roles in a little bit more detail. Hi, this is Pam Dunnington, and I'm going to go over um, the role of the instructional designer. And when we, as instructional designers, are assigned a course, we set up a kickoff meeting to plan out how we are going to work on the course and collaborate in a guiding uh, manner with the SME. Um, we set up some parameters on how we would like the course to be structured and look at how many assignments and what kind of activities are within the course. Instructional designer roles probably have changed a little bit over the last couple of years and I'm sure that they are, we have a new team and I'm sure that those roles are going to continue to change uh, as, we, as we move forward. But one of the things that we do is we provide a great deal of resources for the subject matter expert. The subject matter expert is the expert in the content. They know all about their field, whereas the instructional designer as a learning professional is going to provide a means for the student to, to look at how the student can best absorb and be able to provide the best learning material for the student. So we are going to look at various ways to deliver the content. It may be interactive activities, it may be providing some open educational resources that the subject matter expert has demonstrated an interest in. We also will design the course shell in D2L. That content has material that has been created by the SME. So we really want to have the subject matter expert provide the instructional designers with lectures, which we are calling explorations, and learning activities that they have written. We don't want to have material that is not created by the people that work within our system for the courses. We really want to have that personal touch. So we also want to be able to make sure that our courses are accessible to all learners. And some of that includes being able to caption any images, being able to caption videos. We want to be able to make sure that if a need arises, we also have the means to 
provide learners with an alternative way to access the material. Um, the instructional designers also want to be able to be a resource for the subject matter expert as they move through that process. All right. Thanks, Pam. Um, it used to be that when we undertook a course project, the program chair uh, was doing a lot of the work along with the subject matter expert uh, with, of course, the instructional designer taking care of the actual course design issues like Pam just talked about. It, it was determined that this level of program chair uh, involvement and responsibility was not really working out well with the with the overall work responsibilities that a program chair has. So one of the changes in the process is that uh, much of the work which would have been carried out by the program chair along with the SME has been switched to the associate dean uh, for that particular division. But the program chair still plays uh, an important role in the course project, namely the steps that you see here on this screen. The program chair selects the SME, and every program chair may have their own preferred method for how they do that. Um, a chair may have a particular instructor in mind when a course project idea comes up. Uh, the, the chair might think that, you know, one particular instructor would be a really good choice for that particular course. Uh, or some program chairs may contact uh, several of their instructors and ask who might be interested in doing this project. Once an SME is selected, the program chair also creates the project contract. There's an actual contract document that the SME is given uh, detailing uh, what their work uh, will be in terms of when it starts and when it ends, what their pay will be. And an SME can work on a course project while also teaching. Uh, the chair just has to be sure that the SME's overall workload uh, is not uh, too excessive. The chair will also provide assistance um, as necessary regarding the project vision. At the start of a course project, one of the early steps, as you heard previously today, is coming up with a vision for the course. And that is formally listed as one of the tasks of the associate dean, but certainly he or she uh, can communicate with the program chair about ideas for the vision of the course. And here is that uh, role that we've mentioned uh, for the associate dean in a course project. The associate dean will be responsible for creating the overall vision of the course. The associate dean will also consult with the SME and the instructional designer on an ongoing basis during the course of the project. Um, regarding how it's going and if, if certain deadlines were established, you know, how the deadlines are being met. And the instructional designer will also be working on that type of detail with the SME. And then once the course is finished, the associate dean uh, will be reviewing the course with a final design checklist as sort of a, a final step uh, in the whole process of revising that course or creating that new course. Thanks, John. So um, the last, or sorry, second to last, we don't want to skip the role of the SME in our role of the SME webinar. The second to last role we're going to look at here is the online librarian. And 
At CCC Online, our online librarian uh, right now is Brittany Dudek, and she is part of our Center for Academic Excellence. And her role is really to kind of curate a collection of online resources that CCC Online has access to, including same things like Films on Demand, uh, which is a, a library of, of online videos that we can put into our classes. Um, but she's also just a general expert in things like open educational materials, as well as copyright and um, ADA compliance. So her role, a lot of it can take place in the first step of the course design process, just being someone that any of the other folks in the process can consult with to get recommendations on open educational materials or other materials that she's put together or that we have access to, or even just other websites that she happens to know about. And then if there are any questions about copyright compliance or ADA compliance, she can be a great resource for that. So just as an example, um, I'm helping to design a couple of courses right now, and yesterday we met with Brittany to just show her the uh, lecture notes, the explorations that our SME was putting together, and she gave him some advice as far as citing the images that he used correctly and um, some ADA compliance advice when linking out to videos that he wanted to include. Thanks, Sean. The role of the subject matter expert. So one of the one of the things that Sean had touched on was the role of the online librarian. And that has been something that really has been beneficial to our subject matter experts as, as they're creating their original content. And when we are creating original content for our courses, the subject matter expert one of the key functions is creating that syllabus, being able to write explorations, the lecture notes. And those can be delivered in a variety of ways. They don't have to be um, one particular manner. But what we're really looking for is for a subject matter expert to breathe life into the content. We want the students to know that the, that the content is tailored towards their learning. We also want assignments, which include the discussions. We want them relevant. We want them to be able to uh, be able to recognize that this is something that is real life relevant. And along with their assignments that such as essays or projects, the role of the subject matter expert is to take their expertise and provide those unique assignments and learning activities that, that they are formulating. The quizzes, quizzes can be two different kinds. They can also, they can be practice quizzes in which you're checking non-graded ways for students to be able to assess their own learning, but they can also be the quizzes that we regularly use as exams in our courses. We are really wanting our subject matter experts to take an opportunity to create their own quizzes. We know that the publishers provide some very good quizzes and those have been used a great deal, but it is very helpful for our subject matter experts to be able to create their own quizzes that align with the objectives that they have written. Our discussions, again, they should be something where a student can communicate with their fellow students on a topic that has been selected and is facilitated by the instructors. We are searching for the means to enhance our courses as much as possible with open educational resources. And we have a lot of resources that are available to our subject matter experts. Brittany is a wonderful resource. In our instructional design team, we have members within our instructional design team that have a, have a large library of open educational resources, and they are wanting to share that with anyone that is working on their courses.
So that kind of wraps up our course design process and the detailed look at the roles that we wanted to do. And so this just kind of brings us back and looks at that process one more time. And we wanted to kind of pause here before we move into a few other things to see if anybody had any questions before we move on. So again, you can go ahead and type your questions into the Q&A panel if you have them, or if you want to try speaking your question, you can click that hand raise feedback icon and we will pass you the microphone. Okay, it looks like we don't have any questions for now, but again, we will have time at the end. So if there's anything that you think of, we'll be sure to touch on it. All right, um, I wanted to uh, just follow up on a point that Pam made regarding open educational resources. We have uh, been told by our academic dean at CCC Online, uh, Terry Reeves, that a major goal for future course projects will be to make the courses open resource, to not be tied to a particular textbook and, you know, be having to watch the new editions that come out of that textbook. So for those of you who get involved in future course projects as an SME, you'll probably uh, be hearing that point uh, emphasized that one of the goals of the project may be to identify enough open resources on the internet that are available to support the course assignments. And uh, as Pam has explained, our CCC Online Librarian is a great resource for that, and so are the instructional designers. Uh, so it is doable. Um, now to get to the uh, slide that we're looking at, when a project is getting underway, the course builder document is created, and it contains the elements that you see here, the course vision, which has been created is primarily the responsibility of the associate dean, but certainly with input and any ideas from the chair and the SME. The course builder document also will reference the course competencies. And uh, we have a lot of initials <laughs> following that. The uh, Colorado Community College system at the state level has established what's called the common course numbering system. And that is a listing of all courses that are offered by Colorado's community colleges and by CCC Online, and the required competencies for those courses. And so whatever the competencies are for the particular course that the SME is working on, they will be listed in this course builder document, and they will be one of the important uh, guiding elements of the project because each course has to meet the state competency requirements for that course. Also, the learning objectives will be laid out in the course builder document. Um, these objectives will be goals that can be met through the course and that are measurable and definable. Um, there will also be something called the course map. This has been a term that's been around for a long time. Um, every course used to have or should have had um, in its documents a copy of the course map showing all the competencies, showing all the assignments, um, which uh, learning objectives and goals uh, each assignment meets, et cetera. Uh, the course map is not like that anymore, but a sort of revised, more uh, current version of the course map is now part of the course builder document.
And uh, Hi, this is oh, are you still? I'm going to shut up. <laughs> All right, this is Pam, and I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about the course builder document. And as John mentioned, that this has taken the place of the former uh, tool that we used, which was the course map. And it was carefully looked at, and we, we took feedback from the SMEs and the AEDs, and what we tried to do was create a document that had the elemental tools that were in the course map, but design it and, and put it into a format that was a little bit more uh, user-friendly and that we could continue to improve upon because that's what, that's what we at CCC Online are about, continuous improvement. And so if you look at the first but uh, this slide about the course builder document, you see the general information and you see the responsible, responsible party, which the course information comes from the associate dean, and then we have the introduction, and then we have our little labeling code, which is red for the associate dean, blue for the SME, and the green for the ID. So when you fill out this particular document, it may be useful, especially from those courses that that uh, already have the existing course map from the legacy courses and that have been developed over the last couple of years, and to at least use that as a, as a point of reference. But then we're going to continue to, this particular document will go in the course under the instructor notes in the same fashion that the old course map did. So on this particular page, you see the first term deliverables. And on the deliverables, you should see the very first thing that will be filled out is a vision from the associate dean on the rationale and how they see the course to be uh, developed. And that information could just say why that they're creating the course, especially if it's a new course. They may want to state something about the need for that particular course. And they also may say something about the format of that course. For example, um, if that particular course, if the intention is to have it as a 15-week, a 10-week, and a six-week course. And then below that, you'll see the CCNS description, which it will be provided by the associate dean, and the re recommended prerequisite knowledge. Our courses, do not have required prerequisites. However, that does not mean that an associate dean or the SME does not recognize that some prerequisite knowledge would be important. So this is a place in which the associate dean has the opportunity to say, if you're taking this particular course, it would be a good idea for students to have this prerequisite knowledge. So again, we go down to the content criteria from DT Pathways. If a course has that guaranteed transfer, then we want to make sure that we include some of that information so that the SME, when they're moving forward on the development of the course, that they adhere to those standards so that the uh, courses when the student wants to transfer, they will get transfer credit for them. And then again, the CCNS standard competencies, the AD will be able to plug those into this particular document for the SME to utilize. All right, and the CCNS also provides a topical outline for the course, and that will be put into to this particular document. That does not mean that the order of the topical outline is the, the exact information, the exact order that the SME has to put the material, but that is what the topics that are going to be covered. The next one that you will see is a deliverable project schedule. This is set up during the kickoff meeting. And this is a very important and valuable document for both the ID, the SME, and the AD. And that's because we all have 
to get the course done by a designated date. We want to make sure that we allow ourselves to have the time to have well-written content, to be able to adhere to accessibility standards, and to be able to create the content. So when we, as instructional designers, set up those deliverable dates, that way we have a chance to review the material. And during the kickoff date, during that kickoff meeting, that's generally when this project schedule is discussed and created. And they build in chunks of deliverables so that the SME can receive feedback as well, and if questions are asked. And then we can also give, as an instructional designer, if we see a particular content could be designed to be a interactive activity, or if we know of a particular resource, then we have an opportunity to share that with the SME as well. So as we go through the course, you may, you will work with the instructional designer and you will have some timelines built in. Those timelines may be one week, two week, it may be chunks of one module, two modules. Some of that depends on how you have envisioned the course and how the AD has proposed that course be created. But when we get down to the final deadline, we need to make sure that, that in each deadline, once they're met, that the content has been approved and we're able to move on so that when we get to that final deadline, we can create that course with the goals in mind that we want that course to meet certain standards. And all the, all the parties have been able to review the material. And once you get down to the deliverables three, we look at what the course re resource list is. And being able to provide the ISBN number, the edition, the publisher, all that information is relevant, especially if we're using multiple resources. And it's also very good if you have the recommended resources to be able to specify and have that information. So if this is an open educational resource, you're also going to want to be able to include that information in this piece as well. Deliverable for the course map. So you'll be able to, if you have worked on a course previously, you're going to be able to see that this is a very different format. It's really the same information for the most part, but it does look very different. So if you have a previous course map that you've used and you are going to use some of the information, that's still acceptable to use some of that information, but we really want to put it in this layout. And we want to look at the alignment, and that's part of the quality matters piece, is we have a module objectives. This is what we want the students to be able to meet these learning outcomes. And we list those. This particular uh, page is showing five. That does not mean that you have to have five. It doesn't mean that you're limited to five. But we also want to make sure that we are able to have learning objectives that students are going to be able to meet. We want to look at where those objectives align with the course competencies. If you have a great learning objective, but it doesn't meet any of the course competencies, then it's not relevant to this particular course. We want to make sure that any learning outcome matches what at least aligns with the standard competencies. And we also want to find out how are we assessing those objectives. So in the last column where it says aligns with content criteria, this is an opportunity where the, the SME looks at what assignment. So it might be um, 
discussion, you know, uh, module one, discussion one, uh, aligns to module objective one. And not every assignment is going to align with every objective. Not every uh, exam is going to have every, everything that has been already encompassed in the course, but it should meet the objectives. So if there is a great assignment, but it doesn't align to the objectives, then it wouldn't be, it, it does not meet the requirements to be in the course. The outline of the notes, you, those, this particular place is, an, uh, is a, where you would put generally just the conceptual ideas of what you're planning on putting in that module. This doesn't mean that you have to have a formal outline and that you're going to have an outline in your actual explorations, but it's a way, it's a place for you to jot down what the lecture conceptual ideas are going to be for that module. All right, uh, we also see the assignments and the learning activities. Assignments being graded activities, learning activities are those that you would consider non-graded activities. So there may be assignments in there such as an essay, there could be a project, there could be a discussion is also included on the assignments and learning activities. You look at what module objective it is aligning with and you put down what that is. And then the, the first column would be for the SME to fill that out and the second column is to I'm sorry, I'm looking at this. Um, this is something where the, uh, the is, I'm looking at this, I'm so sorry, and I think that there has been something that has changed because at this particular time, the assignment, the assignment learning activities on the left are what, for a particular module, and then you would put in the next column where it aligns to that learning, the module objective. The right-hand column, the far right-hand column is repeating what is in the next column, so we'll have to look and see what that is. The formal yeah. assessment would, Sorry, I don't. I think that that's um, supposed to say where it links in the content um, or what where it aligns with the content, something like that, because I was just filling one of these out working on one okay. of today, and I think that you're yeah. right. I think that, that that second column there is, is not correct. <laughs> yeah, it has been altered, so we'll make sure that uh, when we, maybe we can get this updated to include that information. So it, it has information on that. So oh, that we can, you know what, yes. You know what I think it is? I think it's the that third one down, summative assessment title. Uh -huh. That second yeah. column I think is correct. Yes, it is. So you want to look at where the content criteria is aligning. So I don't know what happened with this, the first two, so I'm very sorry for that. Uh, my, I, I started looking at it and, my, and I realized there's something that's incorrect on that, so just wanted to make sure that I didn't say anything incorrect to all of you. No, that's great. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> okay, so the formative assessment would be an exam, something that we're also looking at, uh, something that is going to be uh, chunked and an exam level assessment. A, a whether It could even be an essay that is something that's a student has worked on over a period of modules. So that formative assessment would be something in which that we are able to see what it aligns with as well. And then we will also look at the content, content criteria or what you would say as the, uh, the course competencies. So then you're going to look at the sub summative assessment as well. And that would also, the formative assessment and the summative assessment in that same manner. Right. When you look at the 
course build a document, you will see that once you have filled out the first module, then the second module on is, a re, is repetitive of that module structure. So once you have done the first one, you're going to be able to go through and fill out the, the later modules in a similar fashion. Great, thanks for that, Pam. <laughs> so um, an important part of what, a, a big part of what Pam was talking about with that course builder document is learning objectives. And these come in in a couple of places. So as we mentioned, um, the state has created competencies for each of the community college courses that are offered within the system that are listed on the common course numbering system. So that's, that is our benchmark at CCC Online for making sure that our courses um, meet co the correct standards. And the reason that that's important for us in particular is because we want our classes to be able to be offered at any, well, they have to be able to be offered at any of the other colleges across the system. So we need to make sure that we're completely up to the standards of the community college system as a whole. So those, those um, CCNS core competencies for each course as a whole are already created and they kind of are the guide for where we go with creating the vision. But as the SME, it's going to be your job to create individual learning objectives for the modules, just as we saw in that course builder document. So we just wanted to touch on a few things that are important when you are creating your learning objectives for each individual module. So some of these may seem obvious, but um, they are, they're really important. And when you look at them as a whole, they're going to help you create important learning objectives. And learning objectives are really crucial to quality matters, which we'll touch on as well. So it's also important in that respect that we understand how to write learning objectives that are high quality. So the first criteria here of learning objectives that are high quality is that they are specific. So we really want to make sure that our learning objectives aren't vague. They're really, they're really specifically pointing down exactly what we want the students to be learning. The second one is one that I think is, if not one of the most important, if not the most important, and that's that the learning objectives are measurable. And really what that means is that if you are writing a learning objective and you have no way to measure it, then you'll, you won't be able to know if you ever met that learning objective. And meeting the learning objectives is the whole basis for the Quality Matters program, which we'll look at later. You also want to make sure that it's attainable. So if you're in a biology course or something, you don't want to have a learning objective that, that says that students need to create their own new form of life or something that they're never going to be able to do in the course. You want to make sure that it's relevant. So the learning objectives that you're creating in your modules should all be corresponding to at least one of those core competencies for, that are listed at CC, the CCNS website for that course. So um, there may be some extra things that you think are, are important for the students to learn, but it's important to recognize that what we're really trying to do is meet those core competencies in the CCNS system. And if we're creating learning objectives that don't match up with one of those core competencies, then it may be something that's not really relevant to this level of course. And then lastly, targeted. You just want to make sure that you're keeping in mind our audience, our, um, our college class level, and making sure that your learning objectives are targeted to the students who are going to be in your class. So here we've just got a quick example, and this is really um, focused more on that important one of being a measurable learning objective. So at the top here is an example of one that's not very measurable, and um, the sentence is actually missing the word, uh, so my apologies there. But So what it says is, the top one says, understand the limitations of political involvement by government employees. So that's an example of a non-measurable learning objective. Because if your student wrote something about it, how would you know that they necessarily understood it? There's not really a way to measure that a student understands something. 
However, if you wrote explain limitations of political involvement by government employees, you could look at something that a student wrote and say, yes, they explained it right there. I have evidence here that they've explained it. So that's kind of a difference between a measurable or a non-measurable learning objectives. And the key there is really the verb that you're choosing. So you want to make sure that you're selecting action verbs that show that the student is going to be doing something that you can measure, because understand is not necessarily an action verb that you can measure. Thanks, Sean. The master course template. The master course template was created out of need that was identified through some of our student surveys. And what, one of the things that it had stated was that our students were having a hard time being able to find the learning content in the courses and having difficulty navigating through our courses. So the master course template was created in it so that our students would be able to easily find those, the, the relevant content within their courses. It also works in the fashion that we have adopted the Quality Matters standards, and those standards are, there are eight different standards, and one of the key factors that we wanted to be able to do is we wanted to be able to have a standard template in which we could address the student learning needs. Again, QM is developed so that we have accessibility issues being met. That is, it is a very important piece of our online learning courses, and I'm sure that many of you have seen courses that, that are in existence now, and some of them have some of the captioned videos, and there are also courses that have captioned images and various ways in which students are going to be able to access their materials. But what we're really wanting to make sure is that all of our courses meet, the, meet that criteria. And that is one of the important pieces of being able to have our master course template. We also wanted to ensure the consistency across the Colorado Community College online courses with keeping in mind that every course has a very important person that is the instructor in the course, and they have, they will still have the opportunity to influence and be able to make a driving force in the student learning. And that's the same thing with the SME, because the SME really has the opportunity to build their own personalities and what they deem as important for the student to learn within that course. We want, that's one of the reasons why we want original SME content. We want those students to know that this was not a course that was not created with the student in mind. We want to make sure that every student, when they're in a course, that they have, uh, they know that they, that this is a course that is geared towards how our students learn and what they need to learn. And in that, we, all, we are also looking at how our students are accessing their courses. And what, one of the things that, that has been spoken about within, our, within the CCCO building is that 30% of our students are accessing some form of their content via a mobile device. And when, we cre when we're working on our courses, including in the master course template, we are also taking in consideration how, where, when our students are accessing their courses. And so that as our courses are being developed, we are, we are redeveloping them and putting them into the master course template as we can because you know that there's a time table, t 
timetable for development. And new courses, of course, they're going to go right into the master course template. And the courses, whenever they come up for a redesign build, we are looking at moving them into the master course template and taking in consideration all the input and all the good pieces that our SMEs have, can provide. So our next section here is course accessibility. Um, Pam, is that something you were going to touch on talk for about us? That. Yeah, I, that'd be great. Yeah. That's that's kind of yeah. one of the areas that that instructional designers are relied upon, especially by the um, SMEs during the course design process. Yeah, uh, during the during the design of the course, we are always looking at how the how accessible the the courses are for our students. And when we're looking at our courses, it's not uncommon for us, for the instructional designers to be able to find out that we have a student that's enrolling in a, in a course that's already been developed and they have different needs. Some of them may have visual impairments, hearing impairments. It may be something just as simple as colorblindness. But if you are if you are not providing uh, a means for the student to be able to view the course, then then we aren't really meeting the needs of our students. And in times past, various uh, courses across the United States, for the most part, they didn't think about students taking courses that may have learning differences. That is not the case. We've got students that have varying needs, and most of them have to do with the color, the contrast between the courses, and the use of screen readers such as JAWS. And so we want to make sure that in our courses, for example, one of the things that the instructional designers do is they make sure that all the content on all the explorations and all the throughout the course are able to be read using a screen reader. And some of that includes making sure that there's not excess code, which that's not even something that as an SME, we don't want you guys worrying about that. But at the same time, I thought I'd go ahead and explain some of the things that we do. In Quality Matters, they want us to use accessible technologies. And it's something called universal design is one of the one of the elements so that a course is designed so that anybody that wants to take a course can take that course. And we also have the means to accommodate them. So even if a course may have certain uh, elements in it that's, that may be part of the normal course, we also work to provide an alternative, equal alternative means for a student to access that same material. I'm going to give you an example, a podcast. Podcasts are wonderful uses for students to be able to listen to something that, is, that an SME has provided and put into their course. A lot of students like to utilize a podcast, maybe on their commute home from work. But let's say that you are hearing impaired. We provide those transcriptions so that the students have an alternative means to have that same information. The course contains equivalent alternatives. That is part of what our role as an instructional designer is. And if we sometimes say, oh, we've got to look at how we can provide this content, we do not want to uh, hold back on the creativity that our SMEs have, but we are going to strive to find a means for it to be accessible to all our learners. Uh, we have mentioned uh, several times today, quality matters. 
And uh, we wanted to spend just a moment on what that actually is. Uh, Quality Matters is an organization. It's a national uh, entity that establishes standards for uh, measuring and evaluating the quality of an online course design. Uh, it is not for the purpose of evaluating instructors. Quality Matters focuses strictly on the quality of the design of the course. And CCC Online is a uh, Quality Matters member. And one of the things driving the work of the instructional designers when they work with you as an SME on a course project will be making sure that the overall design of the course meets quality matters measures. And so quality matters strives to make sure that objectives, assessments, learning materials, course activities align to ensure that learning outcomes can be achieved. So when you hear us talk about QM or quality matters, this is part of the course design pro uh, process in the sense that instructional designers will be keeping an eye on the course development as it moves along to be sure that quality matters standards are being met. Yeah, and just to jump in on that one, kind of the the core of the Quality Matters evaluation is a rubric that Quality Matters has created that they provide that has um, they provide to us as a member that has a number of different criteria that measure just that stuff that John was talking about, um, how well learning objectives in the course match up with assignments, learning materials, and activities, and also just things like basic course navigability. Um, so that rubric is really kind of the core of that. And um, as far as actually getting Quality Matters certified, if some of you are, are familiar with that, we don't necessarily have, uh, we don't definitely don't have all of our courses that have undergone the Quality Matters approval process or review process, because that's kind of an extensive process where you have a number of different people who are certified reviewers from Quality Matters going through the course and actually reviewing it and approving it or not approving it. Um, but CCC Online is working on a plan to put um, at least a number of its most important courses through that review process to get Quality Matters certified. I'm going to pipe in on that for just a moment, Sean. Uh, I've worked on several courses that have gone through the Quality Matters uh, assessment at, at other places that I have worked. And I want to make sure that everyone understands that Quality Matters is about continuous improvement. It's not a, it's not a judgmental uh, way to look at our courses, but what they do is they, they do look at what we have in a course and they look at, for example, as has been stated, the learning objectives, the assessments, instructional materials, what kind of technologies are, avail are being used within the course and how the students are interacting and with interacting with each other, interacting with the, with the instructor and with the content. There's also an element of looking at what kind of support there are for students. Where do they go? If I get stuck on something, if I don't know how to do something. So some of that comes back to clear instructions and being able to make sure that our students know what they are to do and if they can't do something, where do they go to get it? And so that also comes in with our, um, with in our courses we have some student help desk, those kinds of things, those are part of Quality Matters as well. And then, the, of course, the accessibility piece, which I've already talked about. But we also want to make sure that Quality Matters doesn't judge a course on if it has lots of images or if it is a, uh, if it's a course that has lots and lots of videos. If they're relevant to what is being taught, then they should be in the course. Quality Matters is about all about the learner getting the most out of the course. And when they review a course, 
they really look at what's good about a course and, oh, could we maybe improve it here? Have you thought about this? What about that? So it's, it's something that is a very good process to go through. And once the whole course uh, project has been completed, uh, whether it's revising a course or creating a new one, and there's been final sign-off, and it's going to be offered uh, for the first time in its revised or brand new form. Ideally, the SME will teach the course that first semester that it's offered. And even though several sets of eyes uh, have looked at the course, several people have worked on it, it is always possible that there could be a trouble spot in the course which the SME discovers once that course is actually being taught. And the SMA will have an opportunity to identify any such trouble spots um, and, uh, if necessary, could work with the uh, instructional designer again uh, to take care of it. Maybe it would be so small it doesn't require a lot of effort. but. The important point being that there can be this final review that is based on the actual act of teaching the new or revised course for the first time. Great, and with that, that, that wraps up our overview of the role of the SME here at CCC Online. So I'm sure you guys might have a lot of questions, and we already have a few in our Q&A panel here, so we'll get to those. Um, Kristen, a while back, you asked that, uh, you said, I know you would like us to develop our own resources, but I'm confused on how that works with electronic resources. For example, in math, we might, uh, we like to use MyLabs Plus for homework, quizzes, and tests. What type of material would it be here? Um, would you I like guess, me to talk on that? Yeah, I mean, I was I was going to say that I think that my labs. Um, so a big part of that is the explorations and the lecture notes for sure, um, mm -hmm. because there are a lot of great resources as far as assignments in my labs plus, and sometimes they may even have videos and other things that go along the, with the e-text. But really, the one of the biggest reasons that we draw on our SMEs is because of their experience in the field, their own experience in the field. And the explorations and the lecture notes are really the opportunity for you to take all of the assignments, all of the material that's provided for the students in that one module and use your experience and expertise to sum it up in a way that makes sense to them. Do you have anything else to add on that, Pam, or do you think that that's... Actually, I thought you said that so well, but I, I do want the SME to realize that that is, I mean, Sean was spot on with that, because really, if it's, if it's a math course, if it's a science course, any of the courses that use the MyLabs, you still have a lot to share with your students as far as maybe identifying something that you have recognized could be a trouble spot or that you really want them to pay close attention to as they work through it. So this, the, the exploration is that opportunity to be able to guide your students in, from what we want at CCC Online. Whereas you're telling them maybe to do an interactive activity, and that's the activity, but we at CC Online want to make sure that our students know there was a real person and from our place that was contributing to what they're learning. So um, the next question we had was from Jennifer and she asked, how does the schedule work with each new semester in a master course template? Does the instructor still have access to change the instructor file? Will it be necessary to create multiple schedules during design, i.e. 15 week, 10 week, or six week? Uh, so. some, of that, some of that will vary um, according to department. Um, for example, 
um, one department might want their master course template to contain a set schedule. Um, and so the uh, instructor, when they're setting up their course for the next semester, would just go in and maybe change the dates that things are due, but the schedule on which they're due you know, every two weeks, uh, week and a half for the first one, two weeks for all the rest, whatever it might be, would be already set in place. While other chairs, uh, and I, I'm still one of them, um, like to leave the schedule open for each instructor uh, to set up. Some instructors might want the intro unit of the course to go longer while everybody gets set in the course and then all the subsequent units to be of a certain length. Uh, so I think uh, both approaches are happening. Yeah, I can, as an instructional designer, I can say I've worked with a great deal of SMEs on, on altering the uh, schedule for both the 10 week, 15 week, and even considering the six week courses. And by and large, what we have done is we just look at, we don't change the number of modules. It really does, it really is housed mostly within the schedule. And as John said, some uh, departments may have a particular uh, guidelines that they want their SME to go by. But what I have found with most of my SMEs is that we are looking at the chunking of the material and how the learners are going to be able to best get the information from when they interact with the content. And we are really looking at how the module itself can adapt to the schedule. So, so it, it's a lot more simplistic than what you might than what you might think as far as being able to uh, modify a schedule for the student. Mm -hmm. So we had another question here from Greshka who asked if an SME can initiate the start of a new course design or topic. Well, that's a, that's a good question. I, I sometimes have gotten input uh, from instructors about a new course idea or revisions to a course. And then it comes down to the challenge of presenting that information uh, to CCC online administrators and also finding out what the workload of the instructional designers looks like and when the first realistic semester might be for which that project could be targeted. So a, an instructor definitely can communicate with their chair about course revision ideas or the creation of a whole new course. Then that suggestion will move up the line and see if it gets approval. And, uh, and if it does, when it could realistically take place. That's all the questions in our queue as of now. Um, does anybody else have any questions that they can think of? Remember, you can type them in the Q&A, or if you want us to pass you the microphone, you're welcome to hit that hand raise icon there. I think I might take this opportunity to just mention that all of our emphasis in course projects on things like quality and consistency, quality matters, uh, having a master course template, uh, ensuring that courses meet state required competencies, et cetera. This all reminds us of the unique role that CCC Online plays. Um, we are a service organization for all of the member colleges. You know, if a, if a student is attending Arapahoe Community College, they're getting their degree from ACC. Uh, they don't get their degree from CCC Online. But if they take some courses through us, those courses are going to be transcripted at ACC. And so the member college rightfully 
has a strong interest and concern about the quality of our courses at CCC Online. So our emphasis on quality, you know, during a course revision project or the creation of a new course really helps to be another in, uh, assurance to the member colleges that if a student doesn't take History 101 at the member college, if they take it instead at CCC Online, it's still going to be a quality uh, course that meets objectives, is well designed, etc. Thanks, John. It's always, well, it's, uh, as instructional designers, it's always, it's always a, every single time that we take on a new course, we get to learn something new as well. So, I mean, it's really a great opportunity for the instructional designers to work with an SME. The first time you, you work with an SME, you get to learn a great deal about a certain content and you get to learn a, a great deal about the goals and the uh, vision of the actual SME. And then when you get to work with them again, you've already developed a rapport with the SME and it's, it's a growth experience. So it, working with all of you is something that our instructional design team looks forward to. Thanks for that, Pam. Well, it looks like we've hit all the questions that we have in our queue. We haven't had any new ones, and we want to be respectful of your time, too. Um, so if there's anything else, you can go ahead and ask us. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up here. And we did record this webinar today, so it's going to be available on our webinar archive, um, hopefully in about a week or so. So you can always come back and review this if you'd like. And you're always welcome to um, ask us any questions over email if there's anything that you think of later. But I do want to thank John Reagan and Pam Dunnington for taking the time to do this with us today. And I want to thank all of you guys for taking your time to come and learn about this. Yeah, I really appreciate you all taking some time to attend today. Thank you to each of you.